Good to be with you tonight on this final night of the gospel meeting. And of course, I want to begin by thanking the congregation. I said in the very beginning of the week that I was looking forward to this meeting because of the kindness with which you treated me last time I was with you, and nothing has changed all these uh, few years later, three years later, I guess it has been, and, and again, you've been very kind to me this week. I appreciate it very much. All of you who have had me in your homes or have taken me out, it's been just wonderful. The food has been great, but the company has been even better, and so I appreciate the time that I've been blessed with to spend with you. And you all have just a wonderful congregation. It's great to see a congregation thriving and going in the right direction and growing. That is not the case with a lot of local congregations, and we need to be praying for other congregations as well that they'll go in the right direction. But to experience a church that is doing that is certainly edifying, and so I appreciate you for that. Appreciate the good elders that you have and thank them for inviting me to come in the first place and for coming up with this series of lessons that we have been dealing with this week. As we've said all week, they have shown a lot of, of foresight in setting forth this series of lessons. I think it's good for all of us. And of course, I'm thankful to uh, again spend some time with Jason and his lovely wife, Shelley. Of course, they have a wonderful family. Good to see them again. And uh, it's always helpful to be around Jason. I was sort of glad, actually, to see him make just a little bit of a mistake in the announcements. Because <laughs> he doesn't make too many mistakes. I've said joking a lot of times. Those preachers that do everything right get on my last nerves. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I've heard him preach on several occasions. He's an outstanding preacher. And if I remember correctly, when he preaches, he doesn't even sweat. I got to wonder, worrying about that. So to see him stumble just a little bit, that's good. That wasn't much of a stumble, really. But he's done a good job with announcements all week long. Appreciate that. Appreciate all the song leaders. And we've had wonderful singing, wonderful prayers. Everything has been great uh, except the preaching. I'm not talking about that. But just everything else has been wonderful. And I've had a good time with you. I'll continue to pray for this local church. Hope you continue to go in the right direction and that good things happen for you. I would ask you to pray for me and my family as we continue in our work as well. Well, on this last night, we continue to deal with this business of overcoming adversity. And to open your Bibles, if you would, to John chapter 14, we're going to close this series of lessons with this great and familiar text before us. In just a moment, we'll read verses 1 through 4. And of course, you're familiar with this text. Jesus is in the upper room and he has said some troubling things to his apostles. He has uh, revealed to them that one of them is going to betray him. And that, of course, would agitate their mind greatly. But not only that, he has shared with them the fact that he is about to go away and at this particular time where he goes, they cannot follow. And he has even suggested that Peter, one of his prominent disciples, is going to deny him three times. And so you realize then that when they hear that very disturbing news that their hearts would be overwhelmed and certainly heavy and their hearts would be troubled. But I would suggest to you that the feelings of the apostles at that particular time are not completely foreign even to us today because we've all had hearts that are full of anxiety. We've all been confused and, and confounded by the perplexities of life. We've all had heavy hearts. But nobody can give us more comfort than Jesus. He is the great comforter. And even on this occasion, when he had said some things that the apostles no doubt didn't like, he now begins to comfort them. At verse 1, he says, do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. And my father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. If I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there ye may be also. And you know the way where I am going. These again are very comforting words, but these are not only words of, of, of care and concern, but they are words that serve as an admonishment as well. Because the fact of the matter is, no matter what's going on in our life, 
Regardless of the circumstances of our life, God doesn't allow us, he doesn't permit us to dwell in a permanent state of sorrow. He doesn't want us to have a continued troubled heart. And the fact of the matter is, we don't have to have a troubled heart. And truth be told, it's not helpful when we have that kind of heart. And it really doesn't even make a whole lot of sense. Someone has said that in times of a drought, grief has never produced any rain. And that's true, isn't it? A troubled heart has never fixed any problem. It's never brought an end to any predicament. Instead, it just causes us to dwell in the mess that we find ourselves in without trying to come up with any solution. And so Jesus says, don't do that. Don't allow yourself to dwell in a state of depression. And, and it doesn't mean that you are never troubled. Even Jesus was troubled from time to time. But what we're simply saying is you shouldn't allow yourself to dwell in a state of a troubled heart. And again, we just have too much to look forward to to do that. We have too much glory to think about when we think about heaven after a while. We have too many blessings in the here and now in Christ to constantly be in a place of sorrow. But how do we pre prevent ourselves from having a troubled heart? The answer is simply we must listen to Jesus. We must listen to passages like this before us and, and all of the things that Jesus said during his earthly ministry and even extend it to the things that he said through his inspired, his inspired apostles, all of the comfort that we receive from the word of God. But particularly in this text before us, he says some things that are very comforting. He tells us how that we can triumph over a troubled heart. And in verse 1, he says two things in particular that, that we need to do. He says, believe in God, believe also in me. That's how you overcome adversity in real life. And we have tried all this week to talk about and make reference to real life situations when, when we are really troubled and, and, and problems that are common with everyone. Because there's a lot of people who are troubled today. Even some in the body of Christ, troubled, as we have said all week long, troubled by marital misery, where the hope of a perfect relationship is shattered by the reality of permanent and perpetual problems. And people are troubled by monetary misfortune where their bills are too high and their income is too low. And sometimes even their desire for material things are too strong. Or the people who are troubled by all kind of health issues that bring them trouble and bring trouble to their family and friends. Or all of the emotional roadblock, roadblocks that people experience, the, the depression and dejection, the unhappiness and hopelessness. And you look around and all of those things are very troubled. And in real life, people are troubled by all of those kind of things. But once again, Jesus tells us how we can overcome that. You put your faith in the Father and the Son. And so let's just quickly observe those two things, having faith in the Father. The fact of the matter is, this is a direct command, isn't it? We must have faith in God. If we're going to secure a home in heaven after a while, you must always trust God. Have faith in the Father. You remember the Hebrew writer, of course, said that without faith, it is impossible to please God. Now, that tells me something. If it is indeed a command to have faith in God, if having faith in God is needed and necessary in order to obtain justification and continue our fellowship with God, that tells me that that is something that we can do regardless of the circumstances of life because God doesn't give us commandments that we can't keep. God is not going to rest the salvation of our souls on things that are outside of our grasp. And so if he says you have to have faith, that means we can have faith. And we can have faith every day, regardless of what transpires around us and in our lives. We can have faith in the Father. And that is exactly what we should do. Someone says, but my load is heavy. Yes, Jesus would say, I understand that. But have faith in the Father. But my life is just crumbling all around me like the walls of a collapsing building. And Jesus would say, I sympathize with you, but have faith in the Father. 
Regardless of what's going on around you, sometimes young people struggle as they first get started and they think we're, we're, we're working so hard and we're working long days and, and, but still we're just living in a small place. We barely have room to live. It seems like we're working so hard, but still just barely getting by. We, we don't have enough money to pay for the mortgage and, and to pay our car note, and we're always behind on our utilities and all of those kind of things. It seems like we're frustrated and fragile. We're troubled, Lord. We're troubled. Who's going to help us? And Jesus gives us the answer. It's the Father. He's there for you no matter what's going on in your life. Even when it seems like the walls are caving in on you, continue to have faith in the Father because things will get better if you trust in God. I, I'm afraid for the young people, a lot of times we, we think we look at those who are in Christ who things are going well and, and they don't really seem to have very many problems financially and, and everything is going smoothly and sometimes we conclude that's the way it has always been. And that's not necessarily the case. We have said, and it has been said through the years, too many times you know, with young people, sometimes you, you look at 20, you look at the life of your parents, and, and again, they're comfortable and things are going well, and you think that you, you want at 20 what they now have at 50 or whatever. And sometimes you forget they probably struggled too in the beginning, but they had faith in God. They continue through all of their struggles to, to have faith in the Father and God saw them through and he'll see you through too, but you can't give up just because things are tough. You must, in all things, trust in the providence of God. Trust in his love. It's constant and consistent. Even when you're going through adversity, have faith in the Father. But that's not the only thing, of course, that Jesus said. He said you must have faith in the Son. There are literally millions of people today on this earth who have some faith in the Father, who believe in God, but they reject Jesus Christ. And that won't do. Not enough to just believe in the Father. I don't care how strong that faith in, in the Father is. You must also accept Jesus Christ. You must have faith in him. He is the son of the living God. And uh, all of that points, when we say that Jesus is the son of God, that would encompass and include believing his deity, that he is God manifested in the flesh. You must have full confidence in exactly who Jesus is. And he is the son of God. When you look at all of the evidence of the scriptures, there is no doubt but that he is that Christ the Son of God. He's the one who, you remember, took the six water pots that were full of water and changed that water into wine. Nobody could have done that but the Son of the living God. He's the one, as you remember the Bible stories, he's the one who, who, who went to the noble man whose son was sick and, and it looked like he was going to die, but Jesus said, no, he's not going to die, he's going to live. And at the same, the exact moment when he uttered those things, the seventh hour of the day, his fever went away. Only Jesus could have done that. He is the Son of God. He's the one who went to the pool of Bethesda. You remember where the tradition was that people were being placed in the water when it was troubled by the angel and they were being healed, whoever was put in there first. And Jesus got there and he saw a man who was a cripple and he hadn't walked for 38 years. And Jesus said, do you want to be made whole? And he said, I don't have anyone to put me in the water when it's troubled. Jesus, though, he didn't need that water. He didn't need a pool. He simply said, rise up and walk, and immediately he was healed. Why? Because Jesus is the Son of God. He's the one who went to the tomb of Lazarus and called him by name, Lazarus, come out. And Lazarus came walking out. Why? Because Jesus had that kind of power. The evidence is he is the Son of the living God. Who else could have fed 5,000, you remember that, with just five loaves of bread and two small fish. And after everybody had eaten and was full, there were still 12 baskets of food left over. Jesus, without question, is the Son of God. Jesus is the Savior who was willing to sacrifice, the servant who was willing to serve He's the master who was willing to be murdered and the Messiah who was willing to be mocked. He's the guide that never stops leading. He's the good shepherd that never stops loving. 
He's our advocate in our anchor. He's our head in our high priest. He's the Lord in the light, our lamb in the living water. Jesus said, if you want to overcome adversity and triumph over a troubled heart, believe in God. And he said, believe also in me. And that's exactly what we have to do. When we bring that together and we live our lives every day in full faith and confidence in the Father and in Jesus Christ as his son, it doesn't matter what you're being troubled by, you can overcome it. You might have some days of trouble, but you don't have to have a troubled heart. Even in the midst of trouble, you can have comfort when you put trust and faith in the Father and the Son. And what is it really that we are to believe? Jesus gives us three promises in this passage before us that ought to alleviate any trouble that we have in our heart. Three things very quickly that he says. First of all, the Father has many mansions. God, ladies and gentlemen, has a house, and we realize that. You know, we think about houses. We, we often think about the great houses, the beautiful houses of the rich and famous, don't we? It's sort of tantalizing to, to just think about those beautiful houses with great big rooms and spacious closets and all of the luxuries of wealth. And we think about those houses. We like to look at them online or, or go by when they're having these shows and walk through these houses. Even though we know we probably never will be able to afford a house like that, we like to look. We like to imagine. We like to dream. And so to us, a great house is one of these magnificent houses of the ultra-rich. The fact of the matter is, all of those earthly residences of the rich and famous pale in comparison to our Father's house because his house is heaven. And with all of its glory, all of its brightness, you, you can't even explain. Really, the, the Bible can't totally explain how great, how beautiful, how magnificent heaven is. We can't fathom it, really. We can't comprehend it. All we can do is listen to different passages that, that use precious stones to describe that place we call heaven. But we really can't take it in. It won't be until we get there where we can fully understand and appreciate his beauty. That's the Father's house. And Jesus says, in my Father's house, the King James says, there's many mansions. And really, the word uh, transla translated mansion, there, that's not a great uh, translation. Really, it means to, uh, an abode or dwelling place. And Jesus there is not so much emphasizing largeness. That's not really the point. Some translations just use the word room. Mansion sort of throws us off. It's not largeness that he's emphasizing. Jesus is emphasizing the availability in our Father's house. Jesus is saying there's plenty of room in the Father's house. You don't, you don't have to worry about when it's time to go to heaven that, that somehow you're going to be locked out. There's plenty of room in the Father's house. That's the point that Jesus is emphasizing to us. And we ought to appreciate the fact that there are many rooms in the Father's house. Now, if you're going to get there, though, you have to do two things. You're going to have to first make a reservation. You do that by obeying the gospel of Christ. And then you're going to have to preserve that, that reservation. And you do that by walking in the light. And so I suppose tonight even, the, the first question is, have you made your reservation so that you can have a room in the Father's house? Oh, yes, sir, I've made, I've made that reservation because I believe in Jesus. Just as you have talked about having faith in the Son, I have that faith. Well, listen to me. If that's all that you have, that won't get you a room in the Father's house. Faith is important. Faith is essential, but faith alone never has saved anyone, as we talked about even a little last night. You need more than that. Well, I do have more than that. Someone says, I, I have lived a good life. I, I have lived an upright life, a morally good life. And so certainly I'm going to have a part in the Father's house. No, that, that kind of living alone won't get you a residency in that house. It might help you have good reputation among men, but it won't get you a room in the Father's house. That's important. 
It's important, as we'll, as we'll see in just a minute, to live the way God wants you to live. But, but just because you have some good works, that alone is not going to get you in the Father's house. Well, I tell you what, I've worked hard all my life, and I have accumulated a lot of money, and now I'm a millionaire. Well, that might buy you a mansion here on earth. That won't even get you closet space in the Father's house. <laughs> you, it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter how much silver and gold you possess. None of that will get you into the Father's house. There's only one way you make a reservation in the Father's house, and that is by obeying the gospel of Christ, the unperverted gospel of Christ. It's the only way that you can make it. But Mark 1 at verse 15 and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. The gospel is what saves. Romans 1 at verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The question is, have you obeyed the gospel? You want space there. You want a room. You want a dwelling place in the Father's house. You must obey the gospel. How much faith you have alone doesn't matter. How, much, how many works you have accomplished doesn't matter. You have to obey the gospel. What happens if you don't obey the gospel? Paul said, in flame and fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. You have to obey the gospel. Yes, the gospel tells the story about Jesus. It is a wonderful story. In fact, it's the most beautiful story that has ever been told. But there's too many people in the religious world who think that's all there is to the gospel, just the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ and the story of that, and that's all. And if you believe that story somehow, you're going to make it to the Father's house. Again, that story is wonderful. And it's a part of the gospel of Jesus Christ, but the gospel also involves commandments that have to be kept and instruction that must be followed. Even in becoming a child of God, you have to do what the gospel teaches you to do. You have to believe in Jesus, as we've already seen, John 8, and at verse 24, Jesus said, unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. And that, again, is dealing with Accepting not just the person of Je not just the fact that Jesus lived and that he's a historical person, but that he is deity. Unless you believe that I am. And that points to his eternal existence. But then you have to repent of your sins. Luke 13 at verse 3. Unless you repent, you shall all likewise perish. You have to confess with your mouth. You remember Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10. And yes, you have to be buried in the waters of baptism because that will change you locationally from outside of Christ to inside of Christ. And I would to God that we could somehow convince individuals of the importance of that. Baptism isn't any more important than any of the steps that we just articulated, but it is the final step that puts you into Christ. I've often illustrated it. There was a time when all of us here tonight were outside of this building. And at some point, you were five steps outside of this building. You had to take all five of those steps. They were all important. You had to take each one of them to get in here. But it was that fifth step, that final step that took you from out there to in here. And that certainly is understandable, isn't it? Yes, faith and, and, and repentance and confession, all of that, even hearing the gospel of Christ, the story about Jesus, all of that is significant. But the Bible only says that baptism puts you into Christ. Galatians 3 at verse 27. Romans 6 at verse 3 and 4. It never says that about belief. Check it out in your own Bibles. Try to find a passage that says you can believe your way into Christ. Try to find a passage that says you can repent your way into Christ or confess your way into Christ. Those things send you in the right direction, but baptism puts you in the body of Christ. Now, that's the gospel. Now, that's not all of the gospel. As I said, there's many aspects of the gospel, but that's a part of the gospel, and those are the instructions that you have to believe. And if you don't, you won't have a room in the Father's house. You must obey the gospel, and if you don't, Paul said, you will be inflicted with the vengeance 
of God. But then, of course, not only do you have to make that reservation, but you have to preserve that reservation. You, you, you can't roll around in the mud of sin, dress up in the, the dirty rags of misbehavior, and think that you can sit on God's furniture in heaven. <laughs> you, you wouldn't even try that in an earthly mansion, would you? Would you allow yourself to try to, to walk into someone's beautiful mansion and you're covered with, you wouldn't even do that. In fact, sometimes we go to brethren's house and what is the first thing we do? We get to the, the front door and many times we'll take off our shoes and put them by the door because we don't want to stain the nice carpet. And somehow we think that we can dirty heaven with ungodly, you, you can't do that. You know you can't stain anything in heaven with any kind of physical dirt. Heaven is not a physical place. God's not concerned, therefore, about your physical appearance from that standpoint, whether you have dirty shoes or not. But he does care about the garb of your life, the garment of your soul. He does care whether or not there's sin in your life because the one thing that can stain heaven is sin, and so it's not allowed. You remember what... Is said in Revelation chapter 21 and verse 27, but nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. And so the point of it is this. Don't think that just because you're a member of the church of Christ, don't think just because you're a member of the conservative church of Christ, or that you're a member of a conservative church of Christ that is growing and thriving that somehow you can live any way you want to and still make it to the Father's house. How you live is important. You have to walk after the Spirit. You have to walk in the newness of life. Paul once said, walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called, and if you don't do that, you won't make it to the Father's house. That's how you are preserving the, revelation, the reservation that you made when you obeyed the gospel. Remember, be faithful unto death. And then you'll receive a crown of righteousness, Revelation 2, and at verse 10. But when we do those things, when you make that reservation and you preserve it by living the way God would have you to live and the way the Bible teaches you to live, then there's one thing that you can be sure about. You're not going to ever be locked out of heaven. There's many rooms there's enough room for all of us in the Father's house. That's the point. That's the promise that Jesus is making. And that can help us overcome adversity. No matter what you're going through, you've made that reservation. You know you're going to have a place in the Father's house. And then the second thing that he says is that, that he is going to prepare uh, for us a place, or Jesus has, I should say, prepared for us a place. And that's important that I word that right and, and say it right. Notice prepared, past tense. And we ought to understand that because it points to the security of this second point that we, that we understand. It's not like Jesus is going to prepare a place. It's not like he's in the process of preparing a place. He's already prepared the place. And really, I know it's just a matter of time. And in, in, in this passage in John chapter 14, he said to his apostles that he's going to prepare a place. He hadn't gone yet. And so they had to trust in him, believe in him, that he was going to go and prepare a place. We still need to trust in Jesus, but he's now already gone. He's prepared the place. We have to trust that he did what he said he was going to do, that he prepared the place. And where did he go to prepare that place? Someone said he went to heaven. Yes, but that's not where he prepared the place. He eventually went to heaven. But Jesus prepared the place on the cross. He went to Calvary's cross and he died for us. He became that propitiation. He became that sin offering so that we can make it to heaven, have a place for ourselves in the Father's house. And doesn't that accentuate the love of Christ? And shouldn't we appreciate so much all that was involved in Jesus preparing for us a place in heaven? He went to the cross to prepare that place. Sometimes we get, I think, a picture in our mind of Jesus dressed up in 
the clothes of a construction man and he's somehow up in heaven and knocking out walls and, and doing some building in heaven. No. The, the, the father's house has already been built. It's already complete. What Jesus prepared was a way for us to get there. And he prepared a way by dying on Calvary's cross. And we ought to stop and reflect upon all that he has done for us. The Hebrew writer said, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before us endured the cross, despising the shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. That's what Jesus did. That's what it took in order for you to have a room in heaven. To have place, a place in the Father's house, it took Jesus enduring shame. It took Jesus going to Calvary's cross and dying a terrible and horrible death so that we could be saved. That is not something that we should take lightly. It is something that we should think about. You know, we, we come together, of course, and we observe every Lord's Day. We observe the Lord's Supper, and we think about the death of Christ, and well, we should. But don't forget this. When we come together on the first day of the week and we partake of the Lord's Supper, we do that in remembrance of Jesus. He didn't, he didn't just say, Paul in that passage in 1 Corinthians 11, didn't just say we do it remembering Jesus. He said we do it in remembrance of him. And there's a slight difference there. Certainly when we come together on the Lord's Day and we partake of the Lord's Supper, we ought to be thinking of Jesus Christ and him crucified. We ought to be thinking of the fact that, that, that his body was so necessary in order to become that propitiation for us. And we ought to think and concentrate on the blood that he spilt for us. We ought to do that every Lord's Day. But we shouldn't do that just on the Lord's Day. Now, I'm not talking about partaking of the Lord's Supper. That's only on the Lord's Day, Acts 20 and verse 7. But I'm talking about the remembrance. You don't just come together on the Lord's Day and, you, and for however long it takes, 15 minutes, you think about Jesus and then you dismiss him from your mind the rest of your life. Of course not. You think about him on Monday. You remember him on Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Saturday. And then on Sunday you come together and in remembrance of him you partake of the Lord's Supper. You should constantly have this on your mind. You should always be thinking about Jesus. He prepared for you a place, and he did it by experiencing pain and suffering and, sor and sorrow and even shame. And we should consider it every day of our lives. For consider him, the record says, that I'm almost sure that was a bell. <laughs> That's just not right. For Consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be weary and faint in your own minds. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood. But you know who has? Jesus has. So he has prepared for us a place, and we ought to be thankful about that. And you can see how that could help us overcome adversity. How silly it seems for us to be bogged down with the different problems that we have when we begin to compare our problems and what we have to go through with what Jesus went through for us. It just, again, seems silly to abide in a permanent state of sorrow. Consider Jesus once in a while. And then quickly, the third thing is Jesus is coming back to get us. He said, where I am, there ye shall be also. And the fact of the matter is, this is tremendously helpful as we go through day-to-day -day life. Again, as you just travel through life and you have to put up with the drudgery of everyday living and, and in comes pain and suffering and problems of every kind, whether it's family or financial, all of those things that we have talked about during the course of this week, one thing that you know for sure, it's only temporary. Because one of these days, Jesus is coming back and he's coming with the purpose. He's coming to get you. He's coming to get the kingdom, to deliver it up to God the Father, 1 Corinthians 15 at verse 24. And so whatever you're going through, listen, your, your struggles, maybe they're just short, or maybe they're a little bit longer, or maybe they'll even last for the duration of your life. The truth is, you know, one of these days, Jesus is coming back to get you. 
And it reminds us that we're just pilgrims in this world passing through. Whatever problems that you're having, they're just temporary because Jesus is coming back. He's not coming back to set up a kingdom here on earth like premillennialists said. He, he's already done that. He's not coming back to suffer here on earth. He's already experienced that. He's coming back for us to take us home. And that's what heaven is. It's our home. It's our real home. The place has been prepared. And as long as we do what is right and we make that reservation and preserve it, we're going to be in that wonderful place called heaven. That's sure. Jesus promised it. Where I am, there ye may be also. He's coming back. I hope these kind of things can help us overcome adversity. We need to think about these things. Remember, as we wrap up this series of lessons, that all of these things and overcoming adversity from understanding to the anchors to trust in God and recognizing, rejoicing and reflecting and having an obedient faith, a, a lot, a, most of this points first to attitude. You're going to suffer. I could never tell you otherwise. We're going to have tribulation. We're going to have adversity. That's why the series was so practical, and we thank the elders for setting it forth. We're all in the, in the same boat, so to speak, when it comes to this. Young or old, rich or poor, black or white, we all suffer. We have that commonality. But how you deal with it, remember what we said on Sunday? It causes some people to quit. Some people quit Christianity. Some people quit on their families. Some people sadly even quit on life. But how are you going to react? Adversity makes some people stronger. Stronger parents, stronger Christians, stronger people. My prayer is that that's how it would affect you. But you have to have the right attitude. I pray and trust that this series has been helpful. I appreciate your attention. The invitation tonight... And it is a very important part of the service. It's not one that we ought to take for granted. It's your opportunity to get right with God. I've often pointed out, it comes to my mind because of a debate that I attended where a denominational preacher mocked the idea of the five steps that you have to take in order to be saved. He constantly referred to us as you five steppers. <laughs> and he emphasized that it was just a man. It was just Walter Scott, I believe he said, who first stood up on a stage like this and pointed to his fingers and said, you have to hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. It was just a man who did that. Well, the fact of the matter is, I can care less who it was who first pointed to his fingers and said that. The only question is, is what he said biblical? Can he give book, chapter, and verse for every point that he made when he pointed to his fingers? his fingers. And of course, the answer is yes. We gave them earlier in the lesson even, hearing John chapter 6 at verse 44 and 45, believing Mark 16 at verse 16. You of course have to repent, Acts 3 and at verse 19. You have to confess with your mouth, Romans 10 verse 9 and 10 and you have to be baptized, Acts 2 at verse 38. That's Bible and as we said earlier, if you want to be in the Father's house, if you want a place, a dwelling place in that wonderful place we call heaven, you have to obey the gospel. And the Bible is not Don Wright, and certain, it's not Walter Scott or Jason Harden or anyone else who says you have to do those things. It's the Bible that says you must hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. And you have heard the gospel of Christ tonight. If you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, don't just stop right there. Certainly don't just sit in your seat and put it off and procrastinate and hesitate to obey the gospel. Go forward. Repent of your sins. Confess Christ. And then be baptized into Christ. There's no good reason for you not to do that tonight if you believe in Jesus. Become a new creature in Christ and do it right now as we together stand and sing. When we